So, of course, uh, I think we're going to luck out if, for my canceling my uh, field labs last Thursday, Friday. This Thursday, Friday looks good. Tomorrow looks good. The weather this week looks good for us. Not so on the East Coast. Um, we're dealing with this uh, Hurricane Sandy colliding with the Nor'easter over the Northeast uh, section of the United States. And I've been getting a lot of questions about, is there something about this that's tied with global warming and climate and things like that? And then, of course, your first reaction as a climatologist is, no, this is a weather event. It's not a, a climate event, because climate is a long-term state of the atmosphere. But at the same time, it is a data point within the set of data points that make up climate. Um, and I think there are some things that we can say are linking this situation that we'll see today. Uh, with climate. Now, first off, you can see from this image, it is large, very large. We're expecting something like, uh, you know, right now it's still 200 miles off the coast. It's still coming in, getting stronger and stronger. Um, about 50 to 75 mile an hour sustained winds over a 300 mile area. Whew, man. Um, and that's going to happen today. So here's some things that are just non-climatic with this, that it just don't have anything to do with climate. We're dealing with a full moon today. You know, September 29th, October 29th. Let me get my date right. Full moon is tonight, actually, uh, is when it gets full, full. And you guys remember from our lectures that full moon is the time when you get spring tides, the highest high tides and the lowest lows, so the biggest variability. Now, variability isn't the key issue when it comes to flooding, and we're going to talk about storm surge here, coastal flooding. Here comes this hurricane, especially that northern side blowing onto shore is going to have some significant storm surge. We're having a spring tide at the same time. When it goes to low tide, that's helpful, right? But when it comes to damage due to flooding, it's the peak flood that is the real point of interest. And for us, we're going to be taking whatever peak storm surge we have here and adding another two to three <coughs> feet to it at high tide levels. And this is a slow moving storm, so we're thinking right now we're dealing with one of our high tides. It's coming up right now, it's going to start going down towards noon and then hit its low tide at about 3 in the afternoon. It's the one this evening that we're really worried about. The storm will be a lot closer to shore, at about 8.07 p.m. the high tide starts there on the east shore and that's when we're going to be really worried about flooding on the coastal regions, especially New York City. Uh, this is a picture I ripped off the web just a second ago, you know, a while ago. It's uh, the most modern picture of uh, what the trees look like out there right now, okay? So this guy just posted this picture of the fall foliage in the New England area. And you see a couple of the uh, non-climatic issues that we have to deal with here. It's fall. This always happens in fall, okay? Now we're getting a major storm in fall. And there's still a lot of leaves on the trees. That will allow for enough wind drag to cause a lot of downed branches. And with 50 to 75 mile an hour sustained winds over a 300 mile area, that's a lot of power outage that we're expecting to see over the next 24 hours. Uh, already there are places reporting power outages and it's only gonna get a lot worse on that side of the equation. Um, the snowfall in the Virginias, Carolinas, that's gonna be breaking branches as well because the leaves on trees are still there to hold on to a lot of that snow. But enough of those leaves have come off, and they're going to have a lot more come off when these winds pick up and the rain keeps coming down. And all that stuff's going to get caught up in the wash and is real easy to clog your sewer systems when you have too many leaves uh, coming off the system too quickly. And so that could add to the flooding dangers inland. You know, we are worried about storm surge doing coastal flooding, but inland we're worried about flooding, and the leaves clogging up the drains could really add into that. Now, there are some things out there that I would say the scientific community would not jump forward and say this is definitely climate influencing Sandy, but there are some aspects of climate science that make us step back and go, hmm, there might be some links in these areas. We have uh, mentioned the size of this thing, just huge. And we just don't have the data set, quality of data set for long enough time to really say definitively that hurricanes are changing because of climate change. Um, there, I showed you some evidence that maybe they're getting more energetic, maybe not more frequent, but maybe more energetic. 
And there's some indications that maybe they get a little larger, but we are not sure about that. Yes? Uh, I heard that that would just, um, a wider area, like 800 miles. Mm -hmm. Well, what I said was the wind speeds 50 to 75 miles an hour are within a 300 mile area. The 800 miles is the full effect, right? So you're outside of hurricane force winds, but you're still getting affected up to 800 miles. Um, but hurricane force winds within 300 miles. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that it's been downgraded. It just depends on what uh, aspect of it you're looking at. So, that is the radio, oh, the, the, the diameter, excuse me, yeah. Uh, diameter of maximum winds there, yeah. So uh, we're not sure that that's a climate issue, that it's bigger and stronger because of climate. It's That's a big, maybe, I, uh, but it is definitely a big one. I mean, you look at the area that's going to be affected by rainfall, and you look at the area that's going to be affected by wind, and it is enormous what is going to happen today. Um, we mentioned the jet stream at the end of our weather lectures last time. We said that the polar regions are warming faster than the temperate. It seems to be slowing the jet stream. The jet stream is a function of the difference in temperature between those two belts. And if you're slowing the jet stream, it seems to get a little more sinuous and slow down its tracking of troughs and ridges. Now again, that is not a definite, absolute, we're, we're positive about this. It's a, there's so, some interesting evidence out there that kind of leans that way, okay? So can we say that uh, this very intensely sinuous jet stream that we're having today, that has actually got a backward easterly flow on its right side, which is helping to suck Sandy into the east coast, is that because climate change makes the jet stream more sinuous and it can do that easier? I mean, we have absolutely no way to say that. It's, it's interesting, yeah, mm, okay, but this could just be non-climatic. It just happens and it pulled it this way. So we can't really say direction on this for sure is, is something dealing with climate um, or the tracking of those, those systems, the speed, right? I'd mentioned before, if that nor'easter just pushed through faster, it would have kicked Sandy off into the Atlantic, but it took its time passing us on Wednesday, Thursday, and then finally getting out to the East Coast today, right? But there are some things that are out there that we can say as a climate community are linking Sandy with some of the potential damage that will probably happen over the next 24 hours. One is that we have had sea level rise. We can measure that one. And we've seen about 20 to 25 centimeters of sea level rise over the last century century and a half, and we think that that is climatically induced, that the warming of the planet has added water to the oceans and volume to the oceans by uh, half of it melting of glaciers on land and half of it thermal expansion of the seawater about, um, and let's just say 20 centimeters, okay? If we hadn't warmed the planet, if we didn't do climate change and uh, you kept things stable, then there would be 20 centimeters less of sea level that we'd have to deal with today. And when we get this storm surge, and you look around at the storm surge, and it's up there around the 10 feet mark for some places, uh, we're especially concerned about New York City, you know, the Queens, New York there, the funnel type uh, shape of it, and the way that the winds are gonna be coming straight on to shore pretty soon here. Right now it's a little bit northerly flow, but it's gonna start coming more easterly flow here as the day goes on, and this hurricane gets closer and closer to the New Jersey shore. So we're expecting the worst storm surge up here around New York. Um, whatever storm surge we get today, you can say add 20 centimeters or go the other way, subtract 20 centimeters and that's what you would have had without the climate change. So thanks to climate change, you're gonna have to deal with another 20 centimeters and that could be the difference between flooding the s subway systems in New York and not, I don't know. I mean, a 20 centimeter difference could make or break the difference there. And this is seawater, remember. We put seawater down into the electrical conduits of the city and into the subway systems. It's very corrosive. It's going to be a huge uh, infrastructure rebuild issue. Um, so the potential damage here is quite extensive. Now, if you want to try to look in the past for an analogy, uh, Hurricane Agnes back in 1971 merged with a nor'easter in this area. It killed 122 people, caused $6 billion in damage. 
So we're keep, that's why we're keeping an eye on this and really trying to stress to people out there, be prepared, be prepared. All right. So the storm surge will probably be a little worse. Now the flooding inland is more of a rain issue and we do know that as you warm the atmosphere, your atmosphere can hold more water. In fact, as you warm the oceans, you'll also start to change the equilibrium of water vapor in the atmosphere to a point that we think that for every degree Fahrenheit you warm the planet, you'll get about 4% more specific humidity in the atmosphere. As far as we can tell over the last century, we've had about 5% increase in specific humidity in our atmosphere which means that we expect more rain to come out of these systems if you have a good source for it. Now the increase of water vapor, this is stratospheric, uh, but also tropospheric is mostly over the oceans where you have a definite water source. If you're over deserts and you're heating up the area, you're not going to increase 4% specific humidity per degree Fahrenheit. There's just not enough water there to do it. But over the ocean, it is definitely an effect. We are putting more water into the atmosphere and therefore we might expect more rain out of this system. Um, looking at it from a more climatic point of view, not just this one storm, but looking at the sets of storms over time, uh, Munich Re, the reinsurance company, that's the company that insures insurance companies, clearly a company that should be concerned with climate change if it's real or not and they are pretty much they are, they say yeah we see that it's real um and we're seeing that we're having to adjust our our rates for this because we're not seeing one of the arguments has been we're getting more apparent damage from storms and flooding and droughts and things like that just because uh, we have better reporting and recording of these events, and there are more people and more buildings, more development, and therefore there's going to be more damage. And so Munich Ray basically did this study and said, okay, let's take a look at something like geophysical events, things that are definitely not climate events. They're, they're earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions. And yes, there is a positive trend to them over time. There is an increase in, due to either better reporting or um, uh, the larger populations at risk. But when you look at hydrological, meteorological disasters, uh, its positive increase clearly has something else in it and uh, that signal seems to be the climate change. So if you want to say this storm might be a little bit stronger than it otherwise would have been, I think that's fair. I can't say absolutely that it is stronger than it would have been, but with the idea of climate change that you're loading the dice and you're just going to roll bigger ones every once in a while, um, when we put this one storm into the data set of several storms over time, I think we're going to find it's one of the uh, ones that are showing a trend. Um, the amount of rain coming out, I mean, in some areas, it's up to a foot of water falling out of the sky. Now, that's not unprecedented. You know, it's happened before, but we just, again, say maybe this is just going to be a bit wetter than it otherwise would have been, and therefore we're going to have a little more flooding than we otherwise would have had. And lastly, uh, the energy for these systems comes from the ocean. And when we look at a map of sea surface temperatures for today, October 29th, um, we see some areas that are below average temperature. I think that's a 1950 to 1980 average. I got to look that up. But uh, clearly off the east coast of the United States, very, very anomalously warm. They're not just warm, but they're warmer than average by a few degrees, uh, up to five degrees Celsius in some places, higher than average. So yeah, you're going to expect more evaporation to add more water to the system and more energy to the system. And uh, we think that this warming of the oceans is a climate signal. Therefore, we can say that that's a tide of this storm. So I hope you've you know paid close attention there to understand which parts of this I think that they we can say there are some ties to climate change and there are some parts that we're really not sure and then there's some parts that are just totally meteorological have nothing to do with climate um, and a lot of bad luck so uh, watch out you know if you have uh, loved ones out there on the east coast warn them that tonight's probably going to be about the worst so here it comes <laughs>